The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to APA's monthly webinar series. My name is Billy Zadig, Standards and Codes Administrator for APA. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is being recorded. The recording will be posted on our webinar page later this afternoon. You will receive a follow-up email tomorrow with a link to the web page where all webinar recordings are housed, as well as a link to our upcoming webinars. We have webinars planned out through December and many are open for registration. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Please type your questions in the chat box and they will be answered in the order they are received during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If we run out of time and we still have questions, responses will be sent directly to the person asking the question by the presenters. Continuing education credits are being offered for this webinar. Please send me an email at billie, B-I-L-L-I-E, at appa.org to receive a CEU certificate. Also, if you have more than one person attending this session from a central location, please contact me so everyone gets credit for attending. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn this over to John and Jessica. Thank you, Billy. Hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Gito, and I am a National Account Manager here at Western Specialty Contractors. I am located in our St. Louis corporate office. And then we have John Meyer on the phone. He is our Denver branch manager. And we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for taking the time to um, be with us today. So we will get going here. So Western Specialty Contractors, if, if you all are not familiar with us, <clears throat> we are we specialize in concrete and masonry restoration, waterproofing, and facade restoration, and we're gonna go through and touch on each one of those and give you guys some um, some more information on each of those, and uh, we're gonna look at a few jobs that um, to kind of give you some scenarios of what we do. Okay, so about Western, we were founded in 1915, so we've been around for 104 years now. Uh, we're fam family owned and operated, and we're in our third generation now. We have 30 plus branches nationwide, and one, and one of the next few slides will show you exactly where our branches are located. Uh, we have a little over 1,000 employees, and we are um, the largest building envelope restoration contractor in the United States. This is just a little cool picture I like to throw in here. That's one of the trucks in our early days. And from the beginning, our founders, um, our motto has always been good people working hard together to service our customers' interests adds up to continuing success. And then I mentioned we've been in business since 1915. So before that, in 2000, before 2015, we were known as, we had acquired different companies along the way, um, Harry F. Peterson, Brisk, NTW, and we used to be known as Western Waterproofing in many of our branches. In 2015, we decided that we were going to go ahead and rebrand, and all of us went or are now called Western Specialty Contractors under our parent company, Western Specialty or Western Construction Group. So if if any of you have heard Western Waterproofing, Brisk um, Waterproofing, any of those, that those are all us, and we are all known as Western Specialty Contractors now. And then, like I said, we have 30 plus branches nationwide. Here's a little overview. Every one of our branches has a certain area that they cover, if you will. We can always, if you're not located in one of these locations, we you can reach out to see which branch would be able to service your, your area. We perform, what we like to tell everybody, we self-perform 95% of our services. So with masonry, facade restoration, all that good stuff, concrete, waterproofing. And if we do sub out, it is to subs that we have created long-term good relationships with. We're not just pulling in um, random subs that we have never worked with before usually. So we just like to point that out. And as all, I, as we know, all of you are within the college and university facilities. Uh, we are very experienced in education facilities and stadiums. Um, you know, one of the biggest things is if we have to do repairs while classes are going on, we 
you know, take special precautions to keep the news, the noises and intrusions um, at a minimum to allow classes to go on as usual. I'm going to touch on our safety. We are uh, industry leaders in safety. Safety is a major priority to us. Our EMR, current EMR is 0.61, well under the industry average of 1.0. And our current OSHA recordable is 1.82, well under the industry average of 3.0. And like I said, safety is extremely important to us. A job well done is synonymous with one done safely. And now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to John. Good afternoon. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the specialty items of work that we do as a contractor. And um, as it pertains to facade restoration services, you can see over here on the right side some of the different services that we perform. So we've got the mortar joint repairs, which we refer to as tuck pointing, all types of caulking and sealant replacements, cleaning and sealing of buildings. Uh, we get into uh, quite a wide variety of historic restoration. We'll uh, talk a little bit more about that. Curtain wall and window systems, we do the sealant replacements on those, exterior wall coatings. We do quite a bit of structural steel and other types of structural repairs and replacements and th different flashing systems. This next slide here, uh, the Trinity Regional Medical Center in Illinois is a masonry restoration job that we we did a few years ago where um, there was through wall flashing issues. And if you're uh, familiar with brick construction, basically uh, your, your brick facade is built from the ground up and you would build your brick up one story and then a, a lintel, a steel lintel would go in to support the next floor up. Well, sometimes those lintels don't get installed quite properly. Sometimes they get installed right on top of the brick. And then when you go to the next floor up, it doesn't allow for the expansion and the uh, drainage that is required. And so what ends up happening is the brick ends up basically self-destructing. It, it starts to spall and uh, if not attended to, then it, it may be that the entire brick wall may have to be torn down. But if it uh, gets retrofitted in time, then that can be avoided. And so what this uh, slide here is depicting is the bottom left corner, we've removed several courses of brick above a steel lintel so that we can go in and install new flashing and new waterproofing to uh, tie into that flashing so that any water that enters the masonry wall is allowed to escape uh, in the location of the flashing. This is another picture of a different type of flashing. And one of the things that we've noticed over the years is that a lot of the uh, masonry walls, once we pull the brick out, it just appears that there wasn't a lot of attention given to the actual sealing or waterproofing of the uh, backup substrate to the flashing. Um, it might have been there, but it maybe wasn't installed properly or maybe wasn't there at all. So that's what we run into a lot and uh, end up having to re redo it. But um, as you can see in the picture on the left there, we have to shore up in order to um, hold the brick above the area where we're working and then kind of work within that. So it's a little bit tedious, but uh, we've done a lot of this and it works well. A big part of our business is sealant restoration. So the picture on the left here, you can see where the existing sealant is uh, looking a little bit rough. When we see that, that tells us that that sealant is probably uh, either in a reverted state or getting close to being in a, re a reverted state, which means its life expectancy is over. And most sealants, uh, the life expectancy would be in that five to 10 year range. That would tend to be with your urethane sealants. The silicone sealants will last longer. Um, but still need, they still need attention um, after probably the 10 year mark. So the picture on the right is, is showing a pull test. When we do new sealants, we, we install the sealant and then we do pull tests to ensure that we're getting the proper adhesion. Uh, and, and also in order to determine whether it is priming is required or not, just the different circumstances with each different project. This is a little, uh, project that we did in Illinois, the Aon Center. Um, we did 100% replacement of all the sealants in the granite panels and the window perimeters of this, this project. 
Um, so I think when this building was built in 1974, it was the tallest building in Chicago. I know it's not the tallest today, but at that time it was. And uh, so a rather large sealant replacement project. Uh, this is one where it actually started out with urethane sealants uh, were, were what we removed. And then we went back with the silicone because the silicone has a lot longer life expectancy. Silicone uh, sealant is more expensive than the urethane, but because of the longevity of it, it's generally worth at least considering. This is an interesting project that we did in Washington, and this was the legislature building that uh, we cleaned this, we cleaned the dome and the uh, top structure there, as you can see. Uh, it, had, it had a lot of soil and carbon buildup on it over the many years. And so you can see the picture on the right is the uh, final project once the cleaning was all completed. And we do a lot of different types of building cleaning. There, there'll be some other slides from other projects that come up as well. Um, and I just put out there that there's a lot of different ways of cleaning different surfaces. And you've got to be really careful on what type of cleaning uh, processes you use, because some of them can be very damaging to the substrate. In other words, sandblasting, for instance, it's a quick way of cleaning a surface, but you're going to damage a lot of surfaces by doing it that way. So there's a lot of different cleaning compounds, some stronger, some milder. Uh, sometimes it's just done with soft water. There's just a number of different ways to do this. So uh, it's really important to uh, hire a professional architect or engineer, uh, work with a contractor that um, is experienced with this, knows what they're doing, and knows what the different products are available so that uh, damage isn't done to the building. This is a project in uh, at the University of Kansas, which is near and dear to me. That's my uh, my school. I'm an alumni of the University of Kansas, graduated with an engineering degree there many years ago. Uh, this is Allen Fieldhouse, where the Jayhawks play basketball. Uh, I've attended a lot of games there. Uh, this is a, a historic building that was built in 1955, so it's been around a long time. And about 15 years ago, they did a major renovation to Allen Fieldhouse, interior and exterior. And Western was hired to do the renovation of the exterior, which mainly involved cleaning. There was some tuck pointing and some stonework to be done, but this was mostly a cleaning job. And we used a Prosoco, um, an, an environmentally friendly cleaning solution to clean this building. And then once it's then once it was cleaned, we used a Prosoco sealer to seal it up to try to um, help prevent water from saturating the surfaces again, and then. Uh, causing further damage due to freeze thaw and other uh, environmental circumstances. This particular slide here just shows a couple different types of masonry surfaces. The picture on the left is demonstrating a rylum tube test. And what this is, is we, we take these plastic test tubes and we seal them to the building. In this case, it's, it's over the mortar joint of the brick. And the reason for doing this is when we fill this test tube up with water, we're actually simulating an 80 mile an hour driven, uh, wind driven rain into the surface. And so what we can do by uh, doing this is we can measure the rate of which the water is absorbed into the wall. And the faster the water disappears and into the mortar joint, the more, uh, or, or I guess it would tend to indicate that a sealer is needed more for that than uh, if the test tube held the water. And so we measure that rate and based on that rate, determine what type of sealer might be best for the application. There's, like I indicated with cleaning, there's a number of different ways to clean. There are a lot of different types of sealers also. Some are surface sealers, some are penetrating sealers. So it's, it's important to make sure that you um, are aware of those different types and pick the best one for your building. This slide here just shows a, a four different jobs, types of jobs that we do. The project on the left there, that's the San Jacinto Monument in, or just outside of Houston. Uh, it's a stone monument there. We've done, we did a lot of tuck pointing. We did some stone replacement. We did some stone patching. There were Dutchman repairs completed on this. And then we did a lot of pinning of the existing stone uh, to structurally hold it to the substrate because uh, the, the pins that were 
uh, in there originally had either deteriorated or non-existent, and so it was a, a potential of a structural type of failure. So that's why the pinning was done there. Uh, got a, the stone. The second picture there is a, a stone building that we cleaned and tuck pointed. The third picture shows a terracotta restoration project, and um, I'm not sure where this job is at, but I'm going to take a guess that it's in the New York area. The guys there are wearing their brisk vests, which as Jessica mentioned, this is one of the companies that we had acquired uh, several years ago, and uh, they were doing the work there. And then the, the Corbin building. Okay, Corbin building, that's in New York, isn't it? Yes. Okay. And then the building on the right is basically replacing a marble cornice on the top of a building there. So just kind of showing some of the different types of restoration that we do. And these, these particular ones are historic restoration. As mentioned, we do a lot of sealant repairs. Uh, these pictures here show uh, on the left, it's a glass curtain wall system. And on the right, it's a glass and metal panel system. And we we replace the sealants in all types of buildings like this. The picture on the right, the kind of the, the blow up there, shows a preformed silicone seal that was used to, to bridge across the metal joints. And there's a number of different forms that that comes in. You can get it in the flat, you can get it to, to actually like cap a mullion or a butt joint within the uh, mullion system itself. So there's a number of different things that can be done with that in order to seal up a, a building that's got a lot of water issues. And so, uh, again, I think this is something to, you know, if you work with an architect or an engineer, um, uh, a reputable contractor, you can you can do a lot of testing and you can determine what the real problems are so that you can properly seal them up. This slide here uh, is, is about the wall coatings and the picture on the left, it actually kind of freaked me out a little bit at first because I thought, my eyes were playing games with me, but it actually is moving. And what that's depicting is it's just showing that cracks are dynamic in buildings, meaning they're gonna continue to move. They're gonna open and close, open and close, and it's just gonna happen. A lot of times that's with the uh, temperature cycles. Um, here in Denver, I think that we have more freeze thaw cycles than anywhere else in the country. That's because we have multiple throughout the day. We might have four or five uh, freeze thaw cycles that happen within the course of a day, but we all have different thermal cycles like that. And so you can see the elastomeric coating that is in the right half of that left picture. And that is, is to show that that bridges the crack as it moves. Um, there are, you know, if, if you paint a building, the paints generally don't have much in the way of flexibility. Um, there are a number of different waterproofing manufacturers that manufacture elastomeric wall coatings. Uh, and, and that's what I would recommend is, is going with a high bodied elastomeric coating when you have situations like this. And these coatings can go over concrete, they can go over the EFS systems, stucco. Um, some people will put them over different types of masonry surfaces, but that's uh, maybe a little bit questionable. I think if you want to put it over a concrete block, that's great but coating brick or coating stone, something like that, may not be the best uh, place for that. And especially if you've got a historic restoration, you don't want to do that. So it needs to be done in the right application, but the intent is to seal the cracks. The picture on the right is um, identifying some problem areas in an EFS system. And so well, we don't do new EFS wall systems, we do EFS repair. So um, if, if you've got damage that needs to be repaired, we can do that. And then we recommend putting the elastomeric coatings over those EF systems in order to uh, waterproof those uh, to prevent further damage. Western does a lot of concrete restoration and the probably the predominant structure that we do a lot of work in is parking garages, but it could be buildings, all types of high rises, all types of structures. And um, the, the repairs that we do really vary. They're from partial depth, uh, horizontal concrete repairs to overhead concrete repairs, structural beams, columns, spandrel panels, um, all types of concrete repairs. And within these concrete repairs, there's a number of different components of that. Uh, the slide 
refers to cathodic protection. Some engineers will want you to um, protect the concrete with the zinc anodes. There's another slide that I'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. Uh, the expansion joints, a lot of the structures have built-in expansion joints and there's a number of different ways those could be treated. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, there's the below grade waterproofing, which tends to be with new construction, although not always. Sometimes uh, below grade structures need to be excavated and waterproofed. The caulking and sealants, uh, we get into the epoxy injection, chemical grout injections, um, and then I'd mentioned before the different kinds of clear sealers, different waterproof coatings, so forth. We'll talk a little bit more, a little bit more about those different applications in the upcoming slides. So this, these two pictures kind of depict a typical parking garage type of repair that we might do. Um, parking garages come in a number of different types of construction. A very popular type of construction is the twin T uh, precast panels. You might have a mild reinforced poured in place concrete structure. You, this one here is a joist system uh, where you have joists below and uh, they call it a pan poured system that it's poured in place. You might have a post tension uh, concrete structure that would be poured in place as well. We'll talk about that a little bit here uh, with some of the post tension issues. But this one here is basically showing some partial depth concrete repairs as well as some full depth concrete repairs uh, that we do. So uh, we follow the ICRI, uh, which is the International Repair Con International Concrete Repair Institute details and repair methods. Uh, for these repairs. So it dictates, you know, that you have square cuts, vertical cuts so that you your patches are locked in. It dictates how you do your demolition and what type of surface preparation you do to the host concrete that's remaining. It dictates what you do to the existing reinforcing steel as far as cleaning it, coating it, or possibly replacing it, um, various things like that. And, uh, but you can see in the picture on the left here, this parking garage had pretty significant deterioration within the uh, concrete surface. And so uh, we've done the demo in this. We've cleaned the steel up from any rust and corrosion. We've coated the steel with a zinc uh, uh, retarder or not a, a, a zinc paint, which is basically uh, what, what we put on there so that if any kind of corrosion takes place, it takes place in the zinc and not in the rebar itself. Uh, so it's a zinc primer. That's what I was looking for. Um, and now this is basically ready for us to pour concrete back. Concrete can be poured back in various different forms. It might be in a ready mix that we get in a concrete truck, or we use a lot of different types of bag mix repair mortars as well. This is a picture of a post-tension repair. So um, not sure if you're familiar with with post tension, but these, these pictures both have post tension tendons in there. And post tension tendons need to be repaired um, at different times. Sometimes they, if they get wet and they corrode, they can fail on their own just from that corrosion. Other times we do a lot of repairs where maybe someone's doing a tenant finish and they accidentally core through a post tension tendon while trying to uh, you know, put a core hole in there so that maybe they can run some new electrical or plumbing. And um, so we do a lot of post-tension repairs every year. We do a lot of this and uh, it's a very popular construction here in Denver, but I think it's pretty popular across the country because post-tension structures tend to use less rebar. You can space uh, support columns further apart um, creating more, more space, like in a parking garage, it would give you more spaces for parking and uh, some other practical reasons like that. So um, definitely when you're doing any type of post-tension repair, structural engineers to be, need to be employed because there's a number of different uh, functions that need to be determined by the engineer. The, the detail for the repair needs to be determined, the stressing loads need to be determined, uh, sometimes inspections and testing need to be done. So uh, it's just a good idea to do that. Western does a lot of plaza deck restoration. So similar to parking garages and then it's a horizontal surface, we find that uh, topping uh, 
systems. Topping systems might be a poured in place concrete slab over a waterproof membrane. It could be a paver system. Pavers might be sand set, could be paver and pedestal, um, a number of dis different systems. Those, those topping systems, they'll deteriorate sometimes. And then when, when that starts to deteriorate, sometimes the waterproofing below that deteriorates and causing the need for a complete removal and, and a redo. Um, sometimes the topping systems are in good shape, but the waterproofing is in bad shape. Maybe it was never detailed properly. Uh, could be a number of different functions. But if you've got water getting in your, your building, it needs to be fixed. So what we do is we come in and we remove the existing toppings. We'll, generally speaking, we'll remove the existing waterproofing down to the host concrete, clean the concrete, and then we'll put down a new waterproofing system and a new topping system. Um, and I would say that in the last few years, there's new tests for testing existing waterproof systems now that we didn't used to have. We used to have to flood test uh, in order to to determine that there were no leaks in a new system before we put the topping back on. Now there's the electronic leak detection systems that we use that are very effective. So um, I think that all those work hand in hand. I think that those work well when, when you've got an architect that or an engineer that specifies uh, the best products and, and, and come up with the proper details. This is another type of plaza deck restoration that we actually did here in Denver a few years ago. This is a helipad on one of the local hospitals. Um, the Probably the biggest challenge to this particular project is by the time it got started, it was in the dead of winter. And this project, the, the coating was put on when the temperatures were in the 10 to 20 degree range. We ended up using a methyl methacrylate on this because that, that allowed us to do it at the colder temperatures, but you still have a lot of just a lot of restrictions and a lot of issues associated with that. But there was a lot of concrete deterioration in this deck. So the first thing we did was remove the old coating. We restored the concrete back to original condition. And then we recoded it with the methyl methacrylate coating, providing the uh, necessary markings on the helipad as required by the hospital. The, the methyl methacrylates, they're a good coating. They're, they're not a, they're not the right coating for everything, but it's like most coatings, they all have their place, they all have their time, and that's why it's important to educate yourself and on, on the different types and make sure that the right product is being picked for the right project. Okay, I previously mentioned the cathodic protection system. And if you look close in, in these pictures, you can see these little round kind of greenish discs that are wired to the reinforcing steel. These little discs have a zinc puck within the, they're coated, uh, but they have a zinc disc in there and they're connected to those wires that are then connected to the reinforcing steel. And the reason that they put those in is so that as moisture and air and so forth gets to the reinforcing steel, you have this electrolysis process that takes place. That's what typically would corrode the steel and then when the, the, the reinforcing steel, when that corrodes, that's what causes concrete to spall. Well, by putting in these zinc anodes, the zinc is a sacrificial lamb, so to speak, and that the zinc is what's going to corrode and not the reinforcing steel. And as the zinc corrodes, it is actually designed to where it, it basically sort of implodes rather than expands like steel does. Um, when steel corrodes, it actually can expand to about eight to nine times its original size. So as you can imagine, that exerts a lot of pressure on concrete and it, and it puts concrete in a state of tension. And concrete does not do well in tension. Concrete is designed for compressive strengths. It has very high compressive strengths, but it has very low tensile strength. So when you're reinforcing steel corrodes and expands, it's it's basically blowing that concrete up and that's what causes the spalling to take place. So the zinc anodes are a way to help offset that corrosion of the reinforcing steel. There's various forms of doing the cathodic protection. You've got the discs, sometimes there's the, the dowels where you can drill and drop it down in a hole. There's other uh, zinc plates that can be mounted and, and then wired to the structural system. So there's a number of different ways of going about doing that. 
this is a, a parking garage, uh, kind of runs through the scenario of typical uh, repairs for what we would do for a coating. So the picture on the left shows someone that they've routed out the cracks already, and these have been sealed with a urethane sealant, primed and sealed. And then the picture, the second picture, is once the cracks have been detailed. So the process for a, a urethane deck coating is what typically gets installed is you caulk the cracks, then you detail the cracks and all perimeters with a urethane base coat. And then the third picture um, actually shows the base coat material going down um, over the detailed cracks. And then once you put the base coat down and that cures, then you typically you would put two uh, top coats or an intermediate and a top coat. Those are the coats that we then put the aggregate into. The aggregate is put in there to provide a, a more slip resistant surface as well as to provide a, a wearing surface for the automobile traffic. So the picture on the right shows the completed uh, project. Uh, we have the striper come in and, and paint the stripes. Usually it's striping to match what was there before, but this is a typical uh, scenario for the traffic coatings that we put in parking garages. Um, and this is probably one of the best systems that you can put down in order to protect your concrete surface. So by putting this down, this provides not only a wear surface, but a waterproofing surface so that water won't get to your concrete, which therefore won't get to your reinforcing steel, and therefore will keep it from uh, spalling and, and you know, the uh, corroding. Okay, here's a little case study on a football stadium we did for Notre Dame. Um, this was a, a large project for us here. We cleaned, prepped, and coated 76,000 square feet. And this would have been using a similar urethane deck coating system like I just talked about in the previous slide. And so um, this would have been, you know, routing the cracks, detailing, putting a base coat down, um, and either one top coat or two. I'm not sure what they did here. Generally for pedestrian traffic, we'll just put one top coat down but sometimes for a heavy duty system, because in stadiums on the concourse areas, they're gonna have a lot of vehicles and so forth that uh, will be you know, on top of this. So we'll put two top coats. Um, we did expansion joints in the stadium and uh, we did a lot of concrete repair as well on the end bowl portion of the stadium. Uh, this is the type, same type of work that we've done, a lot of work on the uh, Bronco Stadium here in, in Denver. And we, we work on, Oh, stadiums all across the country. We've worked on Nebraska and Penn State and the Rose Bowl, uh, just a, a number of them. Um, but there are similar types of repairs, uh, just a, they're just at different stages of the repairs that are necessary. Okay, this uh, slide here is showing an uh, expansion joint project that we have. There are a number of different expansion joints. Um, there's expansion joints for interior. We don't, we don't do the interior joints because normally that's going to be associated with interior finishes, carpet and tile and that sort of thing. But on the exterior, there's all types of, of joints. There's ones that are good for pedestrians. There's ones that are good for automobiles. So it depends on what you're looking for. There's heavy duty uh, armored systems. Uh, the one that we put in here, the picture on the far right is the, is the finished product. That's a heavier duty automobile system right there. It's got a, a preformed neoprene with a steel angle nosing that uh, takes the absorption for the vehicles traveling across it. Um, some of them have a, a polymeric concrete nosing that goes in there. They're not quite as heavy duty, but holds up really well under automobile traffic. Um, so depending on what you're looking for, you need to be sure that you're putting in the right expansion joint. The uh, picture on the left shows the old joint coming out. And then the second picture there shows what's there once we've removed the old expansion joint. And a lot of times you can see at the bottom of that picture, there's some of the concrete that's fallen off. We, we call that the shoulder of the expansion joint. A lot of times we have uh, significant shoulder repairs that we have to do first before we can install the expansion joint. So the third picture basically shows the forming up and we're getting ready to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, install the new shoulder. And then the picture on the right is the completed expansion joint system. <clears throat> I mentioned below grade waterproofing. This is a new construction below grade structure that was being built. 
<clears throat> where we're putting up a sheet good waterproofing. We do a lot of different types of waterproofing at Western. Uh, we do the sheet goods, we do cold fluid applied, we do the hot asphaltic, rubberized asphaltic waterproofings. Um, there's, there's different products and similar to the other things that we do, there's right products for right structures and it's important to just be sure that you uh, get the right product that matches up with what you're looking for. Longevity, warranty, whatever the case might be, you uh, pick the right product. And that's where the architects and engineers again can help you with that. We do a lot of different types of injections. We do the epoxy injection, we do the urethane chemical grout injection. The urethane chemical grouts are, there's, there's multiple types of those also depending on what you have. But generally speaking, your, your uh, urethane grouts, your chemical grouts are going to be to try to stop water. If you've got water leaking in from a crack, uh, you can be very effective by injecting these urethane grouts and stopping the water. The epoxy injection is typically done for structural repairs because what you're doing with the epoxy is you're literally gluing two surfaces back together. So in the case of the picture on the left, that's a concrete structure and you can see all those little cracks uh, in this picture. Those are cracks that we've, we've over banded the cracks to seal them up for our injection process and we've, in, we've installed injection ports. That's also similar to what you see in the picture on the right. So we install those uh, ports and then we uh, typically would start at the bottom and we would inject the first port. And as the epoxy starts to come out the next port up, we'd cap the first one and go to the next one and we just work our way up. There's various ways of doing that depending on the structure that you're working on and whether you're moving from bottom to up or left to right, right to left, that sort of thing. But we work with the engineers and, and uh, to determine the best course of action um, but again, those are basically used to glue um, different components of the structure back to what it was originally. And the other chemical grouts are for sealing uh, for water intrusion. So some of the keys to completing a successful restoration project are being a knowledgeable and concerned owner. Um, and, and I would say that as far as the knowledgeable part, I don't think anybody expects you to know everything about restoration and what you might need to do, but I think it's educating yourself. And I think that that's where architects and engineers and contractors such as Western are more than happy to, to help you out and to uh, share our experience that we've got over the years um, and our knowledge of different materials so that you become a knowledgeable owner. Uh, detailed restoration specifications by an architect engineer. Some projects are maybe a little simpler than others, and, and maybe it's not uh, necessary to have an architect or engineer, but generally speaking, it's a, it's a good practice, a best practice to get someone that's knowledgeable in that, that this is a specifier. A lot of times there are details that are gonna be necessary for a project, and I would say that the key to about any project are those details, and so it's important that those details be uh, carefully thought out and drawn up so that it, so it works. So if an architect or an engineer uh, works with the contractor to determine what's best. I think that that's, that's generally our approach and we work with engineers all the time to help come up with those. Quality products and materials, again, the architects, engineers, contractors, they can help you with that. Um, we like to recommend that you go with a, a qualified, experienced contractor. Um, there's there are a lot of them out there. We like to think we're the best, but that's probably a matter of opinion. And then solid, solid communication between all parties. I think that that's really, and I think that you all would probably agree that uh, that's really the key to all projects uh, and, and particularly successful projects. Uh, preparative maintenance plans. We, we do a lot of this with our customers. Uh, we help do annual inspections. And most of the time we're working with an engineer and we'll, we'll actually survey a, a site for an owner in order to help come up with budgets. Um, and it's not just for the next year, but sometimes we'll help to come up with a five-year plan or a 10-year plan, something like that. Um, the, the, the third bullet there, the lower long-term cost than delaying repairs. I can tell you, I've seen a, a lot of times where you've got a concrete repair that maybe, maybe today all it needs is to have the concrete chipped out and replaced, but if not done, 
then in a year or two years, all of a sudden that same concrete repair besides growing now has gotten down into the reinforcing steel that needs to be replaced or maybe there's post tension in there and maybe the post tension is corroded. Now that's gotta be replaced. Once you start getting into post tension repairs, the costs just escalate. Post tension repairs are, are expensive and not very many people can do those. Um, and so if that initial repair was done early on, it may very well have prevented the more expensive repair from having to be done later. So um, I think that's where the, the five year or longer plans work well so that you have, you know, here's our, our year number one priorities, year number two, three, five, so forth. So um, that's where the engineers and contractors can help you immensely. Um, and like the last one, you want to eliminate the problems before they become hazards. I guess, uh, you know, we, we get situations all the time where concrete in garages fall and it falls on cars. Um, we really haven't run into it where it falls on people, but certainly a potential. So you want to make sure that you take care of things before they become an issue. Jessica, I think you're going to chime in on this slide. Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and finish this out and we will go and take uh, the questions from everyone that came in. So additional ways we can help. Uh, we can facilitate the building and garage condition surveys, as John was saying. Um, also, he mentioned the, the repair prioritization and the cost analysis. Um, we can help you per put together a maintenance program. Um, we can help you with the, uh, the budgeting and estimating, phasing, and training. Similar to this, we also do local and regional lunch and learn. So if anybody would be interested, we could come to your facility, bring you some lunch, and um, teach your staff more about what we offer. And then I wanted to mention that we will, if, you're, if any of you are attending APA um, this, at, in Denver next week, come by and visit us at booth 312 and say hi. I will be there along with my colleague Doug and John may stop by. I'm not sure, but we'll, we'll be there if you guys are there. Come say hi. And then before we start questions, I wanted to mention really quick um, that I manage Western's national APA account here. So in addition to reaching out to me with questions regarding today's presenta presentation, please feel free to contact me if you're experience, experiencing exterior um, building, parking structure, stadium issues, and I'll be happy to put you in touch with your local branch representative. And we'll go in this, as you can see on the slide, my email address is on there if you want to go ahead and write that down for any future concerns. So with that, I guess we will go ahead and start taking the questions that came through. So the first one I have is for budgetary purposes, is there a median cost to tuck point restore and seal a building based on a square footage or a cost per square foot for each repair? Well, that's a good question. It's a hard one to answer, but it's a good question. Um, with that much information, there's there's not a good way to give a price. And the, the reason is, is uh, some tuck pointing jobs are, it's 100% of the joints. Sometimes it's it's miscellaneous tuck pointing. Maybe 10% of the joints need to be tuck pointed. Um, the brick size makes a difference because the depending on the brick size depends on the number, the lineal footage of joints that are being tuck pointed. Um, access makes a big difference it's, if it's a brick wall that you just can walk up to and work on or is this a project that needs to have scaffold built or maybe a swing stage or uh, something even even more elaborate I think that that is it's, it's certainly something that we can help provide some budget numbers to but it's something that we really need to um, either put our eyes on personally or at a minimum someone would need to see some photographs and then uh, kind of go from there to see what might be necessary. Great, thanks, John. The next one, in regards to building cleaning, is there uh, this more for aesthetics or does it ensure a longer life for the building materials? I'd say um, predominantly it's gonna be for aesthetics, but with that said, there are a lot of um, like algae, uh, blooms, uh, the, the carbon and so forth that attaches itself to the building and that will advance the deterioration of the structure uh, to different degrees for different types of surfaces. So 
I would say that it really does help to prolong the life of a structure if you keep it clean and keep those types of things off of it. Uh, a lot of it's just the city pollution from, you know, the cars and all that sort of thing. Um, and that stuff can advance the deterioration uh, process within different types of surfaces. Thank you. Next one, any experience with concrete repairs to parking structures or loading docks area with glycol snow melt systems embedded in the concrete? How are snow melt lines detected pre-repair? Um, the answer to that is yes, we do quite a lot of that actually. Um, and, and I guess we've handled that different ways. The, the slabs with the glycol systems, <clears throat> generally um, what we would do before we did a repair Hair is, is the glycol would be drained and then um, most of the time when we're going to do a, a repair there the, the glycol system would not be saved it's it's cheaper to just tear out what's there and then add in the new glycol lines and then pour the concrete back and then recharge that uh, for the heat melt system um, so I don't think that the, the scanning and so forth, uh, I don't think it would really work very well on that because most of the uh, tubing for that is going to be more in the plastic lines. Um, I, if, if there's metal piping for that, I guess I am not aware of that could be. And if, if it was metal, then you might be able to pick that up on the scan. But I would also say it's probably deteriorated and it would be cheaper to just rip it out because the demolition process trying to um, carefully work around these different lines would cost more than just replacing the line. Um, so that's that on the glycol. On the electrical lines, we've done that a couple of different ways, but generally speaking, it's almost impossible to demo unsound concrete and not damage the electrical lines. So similar to the glycol, we usually would just end up having that replaced because it's, it's less expensive because you can do the concrete demo faster and it's just, it's a better system because now you've got one uh, electrical line rather than uh, several, you know, one with several splices in it um, that we've done. We've also, um, well, and so, and we have electricity to do that. So we'll do the demo. We'll, if the reinforcing mat has been replaced, we'll get that put in place. And then we'll have the electric electrician come and he'll run the new wire and he'll tie it into the power source. And then we'll pour the concrete and we've had really good success doing that. Uh, the one other thing I would just mention is we've had some situations come up where, uh, particularly this is on parking garage ramps where they've got the electrical heat melt system and maybe a zone here or a zone there will, will go bad. We've been successful at, at uh, trenching for new heat melt system and then allowing the electrician to install that and then we use an epoxy grout to grout back over that and then that way the owner doesn't have to tear out the entire slab. So. Um, okay. That's kind of a maybe vague, but hopefully provide some info. Well, and if and I was going to mention if we're not answering your questions fully, or if they're if, they're, if we're giving you additional questions, and go ahead and email them in afterwards, and we'll um, hone in on on those specific questions a little bit more. Thank Next you. one: thoughts or cost benefits to zinc cathodic method versus epoxy coated rebar. Uh, there's different schools of thought on that. I think that one of the things that's difficult is is you could put the epoxy coated rebar in, but it's difficult to do that without nicking the epoxy and and basically making sure that it's coated the entire length. And if you have an epoxy coated rebar and you've got one area where the epoxy has been knocked off, then that's going to be kind of a target of the of the water and the corrosion. I think is going to tend to take place there. So um, I think the epoxy coated rebar is is good, but it doesn't necessarily solve all the problems. So um, I think that the, the zinc anodes are a, a good addition for a couple of reasons. Number one, because it does act as that sacrificial corrosion item, but also you've done all the demo and all the prep work. So there's, there's really virtually no labor in, involved in putting in the anodes. It's really all just a material cost. So it's a relatively I mean, the anodes aren't necessarily cheap, but it's a relatively inexpensive addition to an already being done concrete repair. All right, thank you. Next one. 
Does your company provide opinions for court cases regarding existing masonry, veneer, and flashing issues? That's a no, correct? Well, yeah, I, I generally speaking, I would say no. I mean, sometimes we've we've worked with people and we've tried to help them come up with solutions and different things like that, but we generally aren't like a, an expert witness type of a company. Right, okay. Is Western special, Specialty Contractors a participant of a co-op? I don't believe so, right, John? We are not. I know that we, we work with a couple of material manufacturers that are part of the co-op and we've been able to get approved, but we are, we, yeah, I'd say no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what could be the best way to fix water leak from concrete hollow core slab? Um, yeah, that's, I would, well, I don't know what the structure is. If this is a horizontal structure, I would say, you know, without knowing more, probably routing and sealing cracks and putting a, a waterproof coating on the top. Um, I understand, you know, water gets into the hollow cores, it can travel and it could show up anywhere. So the, the best place is to stop the water from ever getting into the concrete panels itself. If this is a, a vertical system, then I would say probably a, a lysomeric wall coating. Okay. So mm -hmm. the person that put that question in, if, if you need, if you want to email in um, the type of facility you're talking about, we can, we can talk about it more in detail. Okay, so um, what architects and engineers in Houston, Texas have you worked with and found very knowledgeable? Would we need to reach out to our Houston branch about that, John? Yes, I'd say so. I, I'm not sure who that would be. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and write this person's name down and get back to you with that information. Okay, let's move on to the next one. You mentioned improper detailing. This appears to happen way too frequent, frequently. Once the wall, window, and roofing systems are installed and improper detailing occurred and or poor coordination occurs between the subcontractors, this results in lots of buildings with stormwater infiltration. How do we prevent getting into this situation and how do we address this, these situations once they occur? Has commissioning helped reduce the frequency of this? Uh, I don't understand the commissioning terminology, so I can't address that. But I think on the other, uh, you know, during the initial construction phase, I, I don't think that really you can get away from uh, or, or improve that without having more specific inspections. And, uh, you know, that's going to be more time on the wall, swing stages, whatever the access is, could be boom lifts, that sort of thing. But I think it, it really is just um, going through the inspection process. And that's where if, if there's a, a qualified good contractor on the job to where I think it's making sure that like the initial mock-up or, or the initial part being done, that it's demonstrated that everybody's on the same page with how things need to be done and that that's the way they are being done. And then if you've got a contractor that, that you can trust, then you maybe don't have to do 100% inspection, but you might do spot inspections. Um, we, 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 we don't do a lot of new construction in Denver, and so we don't necessarily get into that, but we do a lot of jobs where we do get engineers to go up there and they do spot inspections in different places. They don't generally inspect everything that we do. Um, so I, I don't think that you can get away from, from that without just doing more inspections. Um, as far as once they're in place, then I, I think that there are ways to do it. Um, and a lot of times it's it's with the building sealants or the or the wall coatings. But I think that one of the things I think about uh, in, in my mind as it relates to this question has to do with window mullion systems. And you get a lot of window systems that they tend to take on water. Well, window most window systems have weeps at the bottom. And I think they have to be really careful that if you're going to do a window sealant restoration, that a lot of times people will seal up those weep holes. And if you don't seal all the joints above that in that same window system, those joints are liable to let water in. And with the weeps being plugged, the water can't get out. And so now the water's got to go somewhere and it's going to back up in the building. So I would say that, you know, the majority of the time when we get in something like that, if we're going to seal everything, we're going to seal it all. That will be the weep holes, but it'll be all joint, all metal to metal joints, all glass to metal joints, all 
substrate, you know, it could be concrete, stone, whatever it is to the metal joints. So there's a lot of a lot of studying that has to be done in this to determine what are the sources of water. And uh, I would say that there, there generally is a way to seal all of those up. It's just, it's gonna be a little bit different with each type of structure. Okay, thank you, John. Next one, we have a lot of old brick buildings and mass brick walls on the exterior and plaster on the interior. Occasionally, we've seen some of those walls allow enough water through that the plaster is damaged. In addition to repointing, do you re recommend any sealants to use on older brick, 100 to 200 years old? Um, I would say that yes, carefully. I think that you know that that's a really good case of you know what you want to be able to select the right product because you don't want to put a surface sealer on that old brick. I don't like the surface sealer so much anyway for brick. Um, they they go on and they are just on the surface. Uh, the penetrating sealers, I think, are are the more ideal because really what you're doing is you're sealing the mortar joint. That's what's letting the water in. If you've got if the brick is in good shape, that brick really isn't going to be letting the water through. That's a baked clay, and that's um, that's basically going to hold the water out. I I don't want to say 100% because you could have a a long saturating type of a, a rainstorm that you know maybe water would get through. But generally speaking, it's the mortar joints that are letting the water through. So tuck pointing and then putting a sealer on in order to seal the mortar joints up would be my general recommendation. But uh, there's there's products that are approved by historical societies and there's products that are not approved. So it's it's really making sure that you select the right product. Okay, thanks, John. We have three more questions. I'm gonna try to, we're gonna try to get to real quickly. Does Western have structural engineers on staff that can provide design plans for permitting review, such as scaffolding or seismic considerations? We do not. We're not an engineering firm or an architectural firm, so we don't have uh, those licenses. We're not insured as a designer either, so we're just a contractor. Um, I guess a contractor with a lot of practical experience, so the answer is no. We work with licensed architects and engineers for the designs. We have other engineering firms that we work with that specifically design shoring for us uh, so that we, we have the stamp drawings for that. Okay. And, and I'll add too, there's, I'm sure many of our branches have great relationships, great relationships with architects and engineers in their areas that we can always recommend as well, right, John? Yes. Okay. Definitely. Okay, what could be the best way to inspect high facade, which is mechanically fixed like terracotta, stone facade, metal facade, et cetera? Well, I would say to date for us, the best way is to, to get up there. So that could be a swing stage, it could be a boom lift, it depends on how tall the building is. And, and uh, you know, sometimes it's not the easiest access to put a boom lift if you're having to block off a street. So a swing stage is probably the most popular way to do that. Um, I, I've been to a couple presentations here in the last two months put on by uh, a couple different engineering firms and they're beginning to use drones to basically go up and survey buildings. So um, I think that there are rules and regulations that they've got to follow and, and so forth with the FAA that I don't know what those rules and regulations are, but that is a way that's being done. But um, sometimes we'll put up a swing stage and we'll go up there and we'll take pictures and, and document to a, a customer or what, ha what tends to happen the majority of times is an engineer will hire us to put up a swing stage. We'll put one operator on there, they'll operate one of our motors and we'll go up together and do the survey together. Great, thank you, John. And last one, do you, have, do you have experience or recommendations do you have for exterior shallow ornamental concrete pools? The concrete cracks and the coating continues to peel. Jessica, would you read that one more time, please? It says, do you have experience or recommendations? It looks like, a, and then do you have for exterior shallow ornamental concrete pools I'm trying to decipher exactly what he's asking here. Looks like he's having some concrete cracks in um, the coating continues to peel in a pool, exterior oh, shallow ornamental concrete pool. Um, well, in a, a pool is almost like a animal of itself in, in the uh, movement that it goes through and you really have to have a good substrate before you ever put your concrete in because really what you're trying to do is you're trying to prevent any kind of movement. Um, I think that that's probably where, you know, like an engineer looking at the original details with what kind of reinforcing steel is in the concrete, was it sufficient? Um, it may be that the joint might need to be routed and, and caulked first. And um, I know most pool coatings are not elastomeric, 
they're they can be like an epoxy tunnel, which is fairly rigid. So if you've got a, a structure that's that's moving and cracking, your coatings aren't going to take that. And um, so I think that there you actually have to look at that more of a might be epoxy injection actually rather than the route and seal, uh, so that you're actually gluing that back together. But the the concern there is, will it continue to move? And if it continues to move, then something more has to be done in order to try to prevent it from moving. So it kind of is a domino effect, and I don't necessarily know what all the contrib contributing factors might be on that. Okay, I wrote that person's name down too to reach out to see if we can get some more detailed information. Like I said, if we've missed anything or created more questions for you, please reach out to me and I will be happy to get back to you with the answers. I think that concludes our presentation. I would like to thank everyone for taking time out of their schedule today uh, to attend this webinar. I wanna thank Jessica and John for doing the presentation. Our, uh, please go to our website uh, um, under continuing learning series to see what we have for upcoming webinars. Um, everyone will receive a follow-up email tomorrow with a link to the recording along with your attendance certificates. Uh, any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Hope everyone has a great rest of their afternoon and safe travels. Thank you very much. Thank you, Billy. Thank you.